Hey, real quick, if you're a repeat listener to the podcast and you really enjoy the content that is being put out on the airwaves here, I'd really appreciate if you go and leave a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. Every time you do so, it allows somebody else to find this podcast, find it in their search feature, and potentially change their lives forever by listening to some of the best experts on the planet on fitness, health, and nutrition. So do your 10 seconds of altruistic behavior today and go leave a review and a comment and I will love you forever. Peace. Yeah, so I think let's start with something positive. That When I started talk, writing and talking about men's mental health, which was probably maybe 10, 12 years ago, some people tried to discourage me from doing this uh, and it was quite hard to get any airtime in the media or... Um, even in the research world, to get funding or to get support from the higher-ups. Um, and there was a bit of a view that, well, men are kind of already privileged in society and, and men, I remember a student said to me once, um, men don't have problems, men are the problem. <laughs> and it's uh, not, not often I've lost for words, but I, I was kind of a bit uh, flabbergasted at that comment. Um, uh, and this certainly wasn't a majority view, and it wasn't a view from mainstream society. It was a kind of minority view, but from a minority that, you know, were kind of powerful from kind of higher ups in universities, from people working in the media, from from other types of people. But there's been a sea change over the last decade where now it's become perfectly mainstream and even trendy to kind of talk about men's mental health. Welcome to the Hard to Kill podcast with me, your host, Dave Morrow. The goal of this podcast is to be a catalyst for change in the health and wellness of our military community and make each of you harder to kill. My mission is to help 100,000 veterans lose 2 million pounds by listening to the amazing wisdom and knowledge shared by my guests. Sit back and enjoy. So I recently updated my website to showcase what I'm passionate about, helping veterans get leaner, fitter, and harder to kill. If you head over there now, you'll be able to add yourself to my new newsletter called the DZ. And I promise this newsletter doesn't suck. Get an email once a week with podcast updates, new research I'm tracking, and exclusive offers. Not only that, you're going to get a juicy, like super juicy, 25% discount off your first online training program just for signing up. So head to davemorrow.net and sign up for the DZ newsletter today. And lastly, thanks to you, I've been able to grow my podcast into the best Army veteran podcast on the planet. In order to continue to grow, I need some sweet, sweet money to start flowing into the war chest. If you'd like to be a proud supporter of a veteran-owned and operated business like this one, you can donate your shekels on a monthly basis at my new Patreon page. Here you'll be able to pick up your tier of support and get things like exclusive stickers and t-shirts, as well as pre-release episodes, fan requests, and more. All this extra income will go to hiring a new content editor once I reach 100 patrons. So head to patreon.com slash hard to kill podcast all spelled out and subscribe today and now let's get on with the show hey folks another episode of the hard to kill podcast coming at you i'm here with dr whitley he's an associate professor of psychiatry at mcgill university and a researcher at the douglas research center he's also the author of a recently released book called men's issues and men's mental health and he conducts research on veterans mental health with a focus on resilience and recovery. And we met actually at the uh, Simver uh, mini conference in uh, Montreal. And what piqued my interest was the fact that he's working on veterans mental health and the idea of recovery. So uh, Rob, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, David. It was great to meet you. Um, and the the day we met was actually the day of the Quebec ice storm or oh, it's Quebec. True. It's true. <laughs> so I, I hope you didn't lose too uh, too much power or oh, went man. to inconvenience. Because, it was uh, <laughs> it was it was a thing. It was a thing. I I got home. I got home that day and it was just lights out. But downtown wasn't that bad. I really so I didn't think it, would, it was going to be bad when we got home. But there's no trees downtown. But when I got home, it was like Armageddon. There was branches snapping, cars getting smashed. It was <laughs> insane. So we were out for about three three days. But thankfully, my in laws they had power, so I was able to bring the kids up there. And my wife eventually went up there, and I was able to get some work done. But I was bailing out my sump pump, and yeah, had <laughs> yeah. electricians show up yeah. because it was just a disaster. And just over a span of really, it was what, like eight hours, nine hours of just insane weather. And then after that, it was like two, three days later, it was like 15 degrees. It was just a wild three days. So we got through it. 
Well, all, all the people I know who were affected who had some kind of military training seem to take it a lot better than the people who had no military training. <laughs> oh, you mentioned that. Yeah, I was, I was, I couldn't wait. I was like, oh, I, like, I feel so useful because I'm like, all right, we're, yeah. we got we to get exactly. stuff over here. Food, all right, okay, what's the deal with yep. the food? All right, it's going to thaw. All right, we got to get that out. Okay, kids, yes, okay, cool, we got that sorted. Do we have like all the provisions we need? Cool, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah don't worry, honey, I yeah. got it. I felt like I was back on tour again. I was like, yeah, bring on the apocalypse, man. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's times like that when maybe people who haven't served in the military get an insight into how valuable it is that we, we have a military and people who are trained to, to deal mm. with emergencies and mm. and how if you go on exercises, sometimes that's how you have to live. You have don't have oh. much fresh food or don't oh, have yeah. shelter and it well, lasts longer than three days. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing was that just a few, uh, well, like I'm in Dorval. So really like the next borough over the next, you know, it's a borough of Montreal is Lachine. Um, actually, maybe it's his own city. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But they had power. And so the gas stations were operational and the McDonald's was open and the lineup was <laughs> insane. And I went into the grocery store and people were complaining, like, what, what are all these people coming from? Why is it so busy? Like these like cranky old men, right? And I just thought it was funny. Like they were completely oblivious that everything around them was blacked out except for here. So it was just the total disconnect, right? It was really funny. Yeah, it was a uh, interesting few days, wasn't it? But thankfully it wasn't middle of January because that would have been a lot worse. Right, exactly, exactly. So um, now... I wanted to obviously know a little bit about uh, you and, and your background because you're dealing with uh, veterans and their recovery from mental health issues. So um, to get started, I love having researchers on because typically and you were just saying offline that you're actually getting on podcasts, which is awesome because I think a lot of the times research is done, but conveying the research, like you're, you're an expert at research. That's what you do. You're really good at it. But getting it out to the public isn't always necessarily what a researcher is compelled or, or necessarily even that great at it takes somebody else to kind of grab that research and be like hey this is what's going on at the research level did you know um, and that's where i like to use the podcast as a conduit for that uh, research so uh, you got involved in um, psychiatry and, and and mental health so what was the story uh, to get to where you're at right now yeah so um it's very true what you say that researchers have typically been people who are very at home um, in front of a computer, looking at analyzing statistics using complex computer programs, and um, being in a library, being in an ivory tower, and uh, I, I'm a people person, so I like being around people. I like meeting people. I like listening to people's stories, and I also like writing and um, looking at statistics. And I'm a bit of a data nerd, but really, I'm a kind of people person. And in research, you can go in kind of two or three directions. There's, there's the kind of office, library, computer direction. And there's one where you can go and you basically have research studies where you spend a lot of time with people, uh, learning about people, learning about what makes them tick, learning about the, the barriers and facilitators towards their kind of recovery journey, their integration into society. So I went down the kind of more social science route rather than the neuroscience or the genetic or the psychopharmacological route in psychiatry, um, where I do studies where we get to know groups of people. We understand um, the barriers and facilitators, like I said, towards recovery if they have mental health issues. We understand, try to understand the programs that help them. Um, part of my job is trying to create programs that, that can help people with mental health issues. And um, I've done a lot of research on men's mental health. So as you said in your introduction, I, I recently published a book on men's mental health uh, and done research on different groups of men, um, ethnic minority men, young men, um, and also uh, on military veterans who are uh, predominantly men. I think it's kind of 90, 85% of veterans are, are male. Uh, and obviously I'm very interested and supportive of the experience of female veterans but most of my stuff has been on men's mental health more recently interesting interesting um so as you started going down that path of, of looking at like men's mental health what are some of the what are some of the things that kind of stand out um and 
maybe before we get into, I guess, maybe the, the treatment of men's mental health um, or what you see from, from your point of view, what are some of the things that seem to be kind of like the general trends with uh, men's mental health? And uh, maybe you can give us some light on, shed some light on that. Yeah, so I think let's start with something positive. That when I started to talk, writing and talking about men's mental health, which was probably maybe 10, 12 years ago, some people tried to discourage me from doing this, uh, and it was quite hard to get any airtime in the media or um, even in the research world to get funding or to get support from the higher ups. Um, and there was a bit of a view that, well, men are kind of already privileged in society, and, and men. I remember a student said to me once, um, "Men don't have problems; men are the problem." And uh, you know, I knew I, you, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to, <laughs> going to go down that route. I knew it. <laughs> and it's uh, not, not often I'm lost for words, but I, I was kind of a bit uh, flabbergasted at that comment. Um, uh, and this certainly wasn't a majority view, and it wasn't a view from mainstream society. It was a kind of minority view, but from a minority that you know were kind of powerful, from kind of higher ups in universities, from people working in the media, from from other types of people. But there's been a sea change over the last decade where now it's become perfectly mainstream and even trendy to kind of talk about men's mental health. We have, you know, Prince William and Prince Harry, uh, who were the archetypal kind of stiff upper lipped uh, members of the British aristocracy now going on podcasts and news programs talking about mental health and the loss of their mother. And they, they've both served in the military. Prince Harry served in Afghanistan talking about these kind of issues we've had lots of other kind of celebrities former military sports uh, people involved in sports entertainment so the, the positive trend that i've seen is that there's much more willingness to talk about men's mental health issues there's much more of an appetite to actually try and do something about it um, and there's a an openness to, to change um, that being said there's a lot of innovation and a lot of um uh, a, a lot of exciting new initiatives and programs happening ra around men's mental health, but they're not really getting the airtime that they deserve. Uh, and they're not, people are not really talking about them. And, you know, Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It, 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 at least in the official mental health care system, the kind of provincially funded mental health care systems, they're, they're still doing a bit of the, the same programs and the same therapies which which are actually very useful to stabilize people with mental health issues but they're they're not too good at helping in that kind of recovery journey that re that progress uh from going from somebody in a kind of an acute crisis to going back to the person you were mm -hmm. uh, or to being the kind of resilient person that helps you thrive in society right i'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you mentioned that that there's the stabilization phase but then after you're stable, it's it's just like an injury, right? Like you're, if your leg is broken, let's say you've got a compound fracture, it's brutal. You got to reset that. You got to stabilize it. You do that. And then after it starts to heal, then you've got physio, then you, you build back your muscle mass. But you're not always in that stabilization phase. That would be ridiculous because it would just wouldn't work, right? It would just be constant emergency care for something that is not an emergency anymore. And I'm glad you brought that up on the mental health side because I noticed that, and I'm, you know, I'm not a clinician, I'm not in that research sphere, but I, I recognize that as something where, especially with us guys, it's like we're always in this constant phase of, oh, you're in, in an acute crisis mode right now. How do we bring to bear all of these resources? When in my case, I, I, you said thrive. That's exactly where I want to go right now. Got rid of the the crisis phase. I'm not in the basement. I'm not lights off. I'm not wanting to dissociate myself with everybody and that I know, my family. I, I want to get really good because I want to help as many people as possible. I want my family to be good, but it's just it seems like the same strategies are still being used. So, what does that mean then to say, okay, let's go from stabilization phase to thriving phase, or you know, encouraging better habits so that you can be a better human being? What does that kind of look like? Yeah. I mean, it might be interesting to take a little detour into the history of psychiatry. Let's, so, please, please, yeah, 100%. Yeah. If you look at the history of how mental illness was framed by psychiatry and by mainstream society, it wasn't long ago where it was framed as a illness that was deteriorating, that was indelibly imprinted on the individual, um, that, that it, 
it, there was a, a pessimistic prognosis. <clears throat> um, so if you think of like shell shock in the First World War, there were many uh, soldiers came back from the Western Front with shell shock and they were kind of encouraged to go into homes and it was considered a, uh, a disorder which would was incurable. And that was the same for schizophrenia. It was the same for bipolar disorder and, and, and that there was treatments that could help you kind of stabilize. Um, but in the last couple of decades, there's been a kind of new model, uh, which we call the recovery model. And the word recovery has been, been redefined. So recovery is no longer just symptom remission or stabilization. Uh, but it make it means making progress in the areas of life that you consider important, that the patient considers important. So that could be going back to school, getting an education. It could be starting a business. It could be uh, get, get, getting into the workforce, changing jobs. Uh, because in times past, people with mental illnesses were discouraged from going to work. They were discouraged from uh, having uh, romantic relationships and having children. Um, they were discouraged from going to educational institutions. So if you read the autobiographies of people who are not um, who are in their 50s, 60s, so qu- quite recent when they were young, saying that they were discouraged by therapists, by clinicians, from, from uh, getting a job, from ha- having children. Um, and we now have this new recovery model, which exactly as you said, takes its inspiration from physical medicine. Um, and, and one of the examples I give is that some people, maybe they injure their knee when they were in a, a teenager in their early 20s. And the knee might never be 100% as it was, but it doesn't mean you have to stop walking, you have to sit in a chair for the rest of your life and that you shouldn't have children and you shouldn't go to work. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it just means, you know, maybe you, you have to stop running marathons, but you can run half marathons instead. Right. Uh, it, it means maybe you're, you're not going to play soccer for Barcelona, but you, you can still play on your local team and coach your kids and have, have fun with your life. Um, and this is exactly the new model that we're using, which is uh, stabilization uh, is important. And that can be provided by kind of hospitals and official health services and, and medication uh, can be important. That, that's the choice of the individual. But then to make that kind of journey and in the recovery model, we always use the analogy of a journey um, that's going to require a lot of uh, positive programs, a lot of uh, positive self-talk from an individual, uh, a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of more like idiosyncratic factors of, of somebody, an individual kind of getting to know themselves or having cl- clinicians or therapists or people around them helping them on that journey. Um, so for one person, it might be exercise could be very helpful. For another person, it could be uh, being outdoors, doing yard work. For another person, it could be starting a business. Uh, for another person, it could be reconnecting with family members that they might have become alienated from. Um, uh, so the recovery journey is a very idiosyncratic journey, uh, mm-hmm. and um, m- m- maybe this is where we'll, we'll go later in the podcast. But some of the research I do shows that the the official mental health system is good for stabilization, but for that kind of recovery journey, it's it's less uh, it's less useful. And actually, what's more important is kind of civil society and 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 the programs and organizations out there which are not funded by the government mm, yeah I, you know as as somebody kind of figured it out on my own and then i got help on the back end um the, the things that benefited me were just training more figuring out like i got a coach and i just started exercising that's why i do what i do now because i realized the power of that but I make no, you know, I, I make no assumptions that this is literally for everybody. Going to the gym and lifting weights is good for everybody, but it may not be something that some somebody wants to do when they're recovering. Physical activity, though, on in general, is is great for everybody and has great mental health um, outcomes um, just by going for walks. And that's what I'm doing now with with a group of uh, group of veterans. But um, the point of what I'm trying to say is that uh, the recovery, like you're saying, needs to be idiosyncratic. There needs to be this kind of map where you see oh hey well you just start talking to your friends you weren't doing that before big win like <laughs> high five you start walking again you start actually going outside hey high five but that's not something that your doctor necessarily is going to witness or even your therapist right so uh, i've been trying to kind of fill that gap in in a way because i know the power uh, that mental health has but on on the side of for 
for, let's say, men to get better? And this is a question I've had with, with other folks as well and other veterans. It feels to me like the, the actual system is, is not geared, and I'm going to say for veteran men, um, to get better because we have an experience. A lot of us are more, you want to call us like more type A, more, maybe more alpha male, maybe more uh, prone to wanting to act and do stuff mm-hmm. and be aggressive, but in a good way. But it seems like that side is not really encouraged as part of the, the mental health kind of healing model. Is there anything to that? Or am I just taking a wild stab at it and just seeing what I see? And maybe it doesn't apply to, to anybody else except me and a few other guys. Um, What you said converges actually with a lot of the research evidence. So the research evidence shows that that men in general, but especially veterans, prefer kind of action-oriented modalities of healing compared to talk-directed modality of healings. So um, what that means is a bit of a mouthful of a phrase, but like a modality of healing. We we recognize that there are uh, very different ways that individuals can heal. And we know that from cultural psychiatry, we, ne- we would never try and impose a, you know, a, a Western way of healing on an Aboriginal community. Uh, we, we'd, we would now consider that to be a, a, a unfair and possibly ineffective. Um, but we, we need to recognize that there are very diverse modalities of healing. And when there are people who have conducted surveys or looked at differences between men and women and just broad statistical differences, obviously it's not predictive for every individual. Um, that men like to be uh, involved in some kind of action. So if you think about maybe, you know, before there was a mental health system or people who don't live where there is a mental health system, uh, if there's a young man like having some troubles or wrestling with some issues, you know, a typical thing might be let's let's take the guy fishing with one of the old elders from the village uh, and that you're sitting face to, you're sitting shoulder to shoulder, you're fishing. Uh, another thing we know, like, like hunting is used by Aboriginal mm-hmm. communities to like try and reinsert young men who are having troubles, saying, look, we're going to teach you some new skills. You're going to come up out with the elders. You're going to do something useful, which is then going to help us feed our families and feed our community. Uh, and that's another thing we see in men's mental health and with veterans, that they don't really like being kind of passive recipients of care. Uh, they like to be involved doing something uh, helping others, helping themselves by helping others. So one of the some of the more exciting new research shows that wilderness based interventions are actually very good for men's mental health and and veterans' mental health. Um, so uh, you're smiling. You know what this means. You know, get, getting some men who are having issues uh, out into the wilderness, hunting, fishing, making fires, making shelters. Uh, the more experienced men, maybe helping the less experienced men. Uh, and every man brings something to, to the table. You know, maybe a man who's good at fishing is, is not so good at map reading, whereas someone who's good at map reading is is, is not so good at fishing or someone who can start a fire from scratch. Um, uh, someone's better at cooking. And the idea is everybody's helping each other. Uh, and in that process, people are being helped themselves. Right. So, so we have a phrase in men's mental health now that men heal shoulder to shoulder rather than face to face. What that means is a shoulder-to-shoulder activity, exactly as you just said, David, I just wrote it down, actually, a walking-based uh, activity where men are walking along shoulder-to-shoulder. You're doing something, you feel good, your endorphins are being released, uh, and, and you're getting to know and trust people, and that might lead you to disclose mental health issues and get some helpful feedback. Um, like I said, fishing, even like driving in a car. Uh, we know, you mm-hmm. know, sometimes a dad will take his son or people go out for a drive and they'll talk about things. Um, hunting is a sh- shoulder to shoulder activity. So w- one of my big missions uh, at the moment is really trying to spread the word about the importance of shoulder to shoulder healing. Uh, and, and people shouldn't feel bad or feel shamed if they don't want to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist and don't want to sit face to face and talk from day one about their in- innermost thoughts and, and worries to a a well-meaning and well-trained person, but who is a stranger and might not, like you say, understand you as a man or as a veteran. Mm -hmm. There are lots of amazing veteran peer support groups across the whole country. I mean, you you just talked about your walking group. You you run one kind of, Mm -hmm. um, they're also very good venues for, uh, for that kind of healing and for that kind of, um, support, which, which veterans are looking for. So yeah, we do, we do need to get away from the like one size fits all idea that, 
mental health issues can be cured by medication and by talking therapies that they certainly should be options people should think if they want them but there's all this stuff happening in civil society is is really helpful for men's mental health and for the mm -hmm. mental health of veterans but sadly they're often on a shoestring budget if they have a budget at all and they're being run by volunteers like yeah. like like you yeah and one thing i always say is maybe the government should give kind of block grants to the community groups that that might be a better investment than just throwing money into big hospitals which is a bit mm -hmm. like a leaky bucket the more money you throw in the more it seems to well just yeah to yeah precisely. right exactly because i mean their bureaucracies are so big right like they they have so many layers yeah. of bureaucracy over layers with bureaucracy, <laughs> and everybody's got to take their cut and so yeah I, we, I was having this discussion too and i i'm there was so much what you just said there uh, that I need to touch on, uh, namely the going out uh, into the wilderness. That's Warrior Adventures Canada. So shout out to the guys at Warrior Adventures Canada. I just had them on the yeah. podcast again. Uh, they, I don't know if you're familiar with the organization, but that's what they do. They take guys out in the woods, guys and gals from uh, the military uh, and RCMP, I believe, to have an adventure where it's difficult they're going whitewater rafting it's 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 intense like you, there's there's danger <laughs> you know yeah. um and yeah. It, it is yeah there's no phones it, it it just resets your your neural circuitry back to this ancestral time where all you had to do is rely on your senses rely on the guy next to you and do your job which is staying alive but also just enjoying what nature has to give you and it, like the anxiety comes down and just i haven't been and I, I definitely have made a point to get on one of their excursions because it just sounds incredible and i always love being out in the woods i mean granted the the infantry kind of ruined that for me because i get nervous <laughs> i just get anxiety when i'm in the woods like oh i'm gonna, I'm gonna be cold i'm gonna have wet feet but um but i i do agree I, i've been even going there's a little wooded area not too far from my house uh, that has a really beautiful walking trail and i just go there just to do my walks because there's a difference between walking in and amongst nature than walking on my suburban streets that's that that's for sure and when you're talking about shoulder to shoulder uh, from the like a little bit of knowledge that i have on uh, men's psychology and like our, our neural circuitry yeah being able to communicate we typically are obliquely to each other and we'll, we'll talk and you yeah. won't go face to face and i i believe that's because typically if we were hunting we would be side to side and we keep our eyes open for whatever we were hunting so naturally we're going to be more accustomed or comfortable being like hey dude like uh yeah, are we going uh we're we going to see that thing yeah how are you doing by the way oh yeah i'm not so engaged and i noticed that with my wife when i'll talk i'll turn away i'll go to the fridge i'll carry on the conversation but that it annoys her and I recognize that as a as a thing because she's like, why aren't you looking at me? And my son doesn't look either, but our daughter will. And it's a very interesting uh, difference between men and women, right? They want to engage, be face to face, eye to eye. But us, I want to sit on the couch and just kind of have a conversation and look away and, and do almost like I'm doing something else. So I can understand why for a woman, it may seem like I'm not paying attention and frustrating. <laughs> but for me, that's just how I communicate. So it's just cool that you mentioned that shoulder to shoulder thing is validated. So I'll have to make sure my wife listens to this episode to, <laughs> to get off yeah. my case a little bit. Um, well, yeah. But ultimately, I wanted to just bring up the, the funding thing too as well. And, and I, I have noticed recently that the veterans affairs well-being fund is a great fund i'm sure you're aware of it uh, yeah. I, i'm a recipient for uh, my athena program uh, we put in another uh, grant for uh, one of our apps which is to get uh, veterans moving uh, as well and, and and active but one thing that i've heard through the grapevine is that they are actively trying to find the smaller groups like myself the nonprofits, the corporations that are right. doing these programs at a much more effective level because they don't have the big bureaucracy. They have the program that is getting directly to the community and it's typically run by other veterans. So it's not this big overarching organization that has overhead and everything like that. It's targeting people in areas that may not be widely represented, but it's getting the results that ultimately they want because they don't want the veteran to be stuck, not healing, unproductive, the goal is to get you up and back into the community and reintegrated because the, for me anyways, I, I see the veteran community, our, our recent veteran community, which I call like the, the um, global war and terror ve uh, veterans. So you know, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Iraq, everything like mm -hmm. that. We have different sets of 
I guess, of concerns and, and, and issues. And um, essentially, the, the this this kind of cohort, I see it as the next greatest generation, but a lot of us are hurting mm. because mm. we had these wide experiences and not many people knew what we were doing, but the amount of responsibility we had, the, the, the level of combat that we saw, the, the, the complications that we had to figure out, we've got a wealth of experience and knowledge to give back. But if we're not doing well, you can't do it. And so that's why I work so hard to try and make that happen. And that's why I want to have individuals like yourself explaining like, no, 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 you can get better. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a thing. Um, And so that's, I guess, where I want to take the conversation next is based on your research, how, how is that recovery happening? What what are you seeing? What are the protocols that need to be implemented? And and like, where is this happening right now so that folks can start getting better and, and, and thriving again? Yeah, so there's not a uniform standard across Canada. There's a lot of localized programs which are very helpful to people who live in those neighborhoods um, or, or have access to those services. So I know those kind of wilderness interventions I was talking about in Alberta, they're very kind of popular mm-hmm. in British Columbia. But the, the more kind of east you come across Canada, I, I find they get less, they have less prominence. Um, but the 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 upside of the modern world is we have this great thing called the internet that I'm talking to you on now. It's pretty cool. uh, It's really good, isn't it? And there's lots of kind of peer support groups on the internet. There are um, uh, podcasts you can listen to. There are YouTube, YouTube that you can watch. Um, So one thing that my research shows for this recovery journey is like, (sighs) there's three things that are kind of really helpful. Like, uh mastering a new skill can be very helpful for your recovery because it gives you that self-belief that you, you are a human who's flourishing and thriving you're not just a passive recipient of care who's stuck in a rut uh, and that could be a simple thing uh learning a language learning how to cook better food or a new food uh it can be doing some yard work some physical stuff learning to do some yoga stuff like this uh, and, and mastery of a new skill is is really good for your mental health. Um, we know, especially for veterans who have, you know, when they were raw recruits, they didn't know anything, and then they, within a year, they could operate rifles, they could navigate, they could survive in in the evening and, and sleep overnight in uh, for weeks on end in the wilderness, etc. So mastering new skills is really part of the military life, and veterans, I think, really want to keep that progress. Um, the uh, second thing which I think is really important is setting goals. So having a goal, setting a goal, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. Um, and for every individual on a recovery journey, that goal setting should be tailored to the individual's um, uh, circumstances. So for an individual who's in a bit of a bad way, sitting at home, lonely, a simple thing could be like, this week I'm going to go out every day and just walk around the block or I'm going to walk down to the local park. Uh, Maybe I'll talk to someone who's walking a dog and just pat the dog and uh, make some conversation. Uh, And uh, to people who are more advanced on their recovery journey, it might be, you know, I've always wanted to start a business. I've always wanted to start a podcast. I've always wanted to um, write, write a blog about my experience in the military. That can be uh, setting goals. Um, uh, A third thing I would say is kind of controlled exposure. So we know that people with post-traumatic injuries, with, with other mental illnesses, sometimes they're afraid, afraid is not the right word. They're um, uh, a bit concerned about being exposed to some kind of issues, being in crowded situations, being in shopping malls. Um, and you can, uh, c- in a controlled manner, you can expose yourself to some of these things you're afraid of. And, uh, uh, and that can help you in your recovery journey. And to go back to my original point, um, some of this is also, is helpful if you can do it in collaboration with a therapist or with someone who's been there, done that, got the T-shirt in a peer support group. But there's lots of amazing resources on the internet now that can help people in these kind of journeys. That, like I said, there are peer support group, veterans peer support groups meet online. Uh, YouTube has a whole load of videos about self-improvement, skill acquisition, goal setting. Um, there's a website I use a lot called uh, Coursera. Uh, yes. which is a, yeah, I'm not, I no, no affiliation with them. So I'm not advertising them, but I'm a, I'm a kind of fan. <laughs> um, you can sign up for free courses on all sorts of uh, uh, amazing stuff delivered by 
people with PhDs and with a lot of experience. Um, so there's stuff for veterans in like their local communities and there's stuff online. Maybe a lot of veterans in Canada live quite physically isolated and, mm-hmm. uh, in the boonies. Um, and I would say they're kind of, that, that they're the kind of things that people should be thinking about if, if they're isolated, if they're lonely, if they're on that, that recovery journey, you know, how can I use the internet to help me and how can I use a local community? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That brings me to Sebastian Younger's book. I don't know if you're familiar with it called tribe. Yeah. I've read it. Yeah. I read it a few years ago. And yeah, I, I mean, it's a short read. He's not a veteran, but uh, you know, I read his other works and he's uh, a great reporter. And uh, I just thought it, it just hit the mark in the sense that a lot of us, when we come home, most people can't really, if they're, if they haven't been deployed or if they haven't seen combat, get the idea that, a lot of us kind of want to go back and this, this, it's this, but it's not the combat. It's the camaraderie. It's the, mm-hmm. we are a team. We're surviving together feeling. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's something that I don't get to replicate here. Right. I, I don't feel that sense of, wow, I'm super important right now. Everybody's relying on me and I'm relying on everybody mm-hmm. else. That doesn't exist. Right. And the closest we got was, the little mini ice storm, you know, like this, <laughs> yeah. you get a little taste and you go, Oh, I remember this. This feels good. Yeah. I'm my family yeah. like needs me. And it's not life yeah. or death by any means, but there's a little bit of stress and it feels good. It's not mundane and I like it. And I think a lot of us miss that. Right. And so to be able to kind of bring that to the, the forefront of your healing where it's like, well, it's not going to be in a combat situation, but it, it, we're social well, social animals, you got to find a way to bring your tribe together. And it may not be your army buddies, it may not be a single veteran, but it may be your neighbors and maybe people on the home and school committee, maybe. And that's something that I kind of had to get my head around where I struggled. I, I just needed to make more connections with literal human beings that are in my surrounding area to start making a better community for myself and it's 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 helped substantially and i'm not in an isolated area so it's easier i i I get it Um, but the internet is definitely a good a good i guess medium for that in the sense that it can connect you with people that could potentially put you together physically um so on on that front individuals if i understand correctly veterans it's really getting involved in your community um and and having a sense of okay i'm i'm useful and i'm progressing on doing something new like part of the healing process is Mm -hmm. is using using your brain in order to solve some problems and to gradually integrate new things so that it's not too much of a overload so you don't get thrown back into i guess like your baseline which is not where we want to be so i think i got that right in 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 summary right we want to take it slow we want to integrate some new stuff and we want to make sure that we're social i think that's the the gist of it yeah and and i would like to just add one more thing that is the gist of it's a very good summary um which is what what we can call like the receiving environment or the receiving community so, so veterans who might be struggling sh- should by not, should definitely not beat themselves up about the issues they're facing, because there's been a massive change in society in the last like fifty, sixty years. Um, there's been a massive decrease in, for example, um, people who go to church or to places of worship, mm. to trade trade union membership, um, volunteering. People who uh, even if you count the existence of like sports clubs, Rotary, uh, Elks, these kind of organisations, they've all lost members. So there, there was a Harvard sociologist called uh, Robert Putnam who wrote a book called Bowling Alone, uh, and the title is a summary of the book where he looks statistically at the changes over the last few decades, and he says there are more and more people like bowling alone. Um, really as we think from uh-huh. yeah like a, he's, he's talking about bowling alone is like in america apparently bowl, where he's from bowling is a big hobby and they people used to do it with groups and now they just go and do it on their own um <laughs> but he's, he talks about you know church attendance trade union volunteering um cadet formations people who are volunteering and cadets formations these kind of things whereas the veterans who came back from the second world war they, they came back to a society where all that was flourishing, which means if you wanted to take a leadership role, if you wanted to you wanted to give, basically, that's the word we should always remember that, that veterans like to give. They don't just want to be passive recipients of services. 
that yep. there was an environment where it was easy to do that. You could become a, a youth leader in your church. You could become a leader in your cadet formation. You could you could become a trade union rep. You could become a, um, uh, a, a the chairman of your local Rotary Club or Elks Club or whatever. Um, whereas a lot of that's shrunk in Canada and the US all over the Western world. People have become more uh, just uh, bowling alone, like Putnam says. Mm-hmm. So it's it's so it's tough. It's not easy to find uh, those those kind of um, responsibilities. You know, volunteering has decreased because of, uh, uh, especially for men, um, because there are some concerns which you know some sometimes they're unwarranted. But people are worried. Well, you know, I'd like to volunteer at a cadet formation or volunteer at a local sports club. But you know, people are. Uh, we live in a culture now where people are worried. You know, men. Some men are predators. Are my, are people going to think I'm a a bad egg, nobody knows me in this community. If I just turn up at the local sports club and say I want to teach the under thirteen soccer team, uh, so, so there's these internal barriers that some men have internalized due to these kind of cultural changes over the last few decades, mm-hmm. uh, which means that it's it's not as easy as it was uh, for the as the generation who came back from the Second World War to kind of reinsert into society and become a someone who's giving something back and, and playing a role and having a meaning in their life beyond just their individual kind mm-hmm. of satisfaction. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The World War II generation, like everybody went. Everybody, everybody yeah. had a role to play. So it wasn't as if a veteran came back and the, the people were asking, oh, what did you do? Well, oh, you were at... There was no question as to... Well, obviously, yeah. like, we saw... like We were making the bullets for you. We were you know, collecting right. provisions for you. We were buying war bonds. It was everywhere. Everybody was doing something. But the, yeah. in, in, in comparison to what we experienced, we came home and I can talk to 90% of the people and they have no idea idea that a mm. what it means to be a veteran but like even that even the war in and of itself it, it's so foggy it's just it's not something that really had an impact on anybody that wasn't part of a military family and so that's kind of mm. the, the disconnect because it doesn't mean anything to a lot of people to say well yeah i fought in afghanistan mm-hmm. and the the only interactions i've gotten were either you know like nonplussed or oh you must be really fucked up and just like, well, well, good to meet you. I mean, like, I don't like, yeah, right, yeah. like, I'm just a human, man. I just did a job. I, I don't know. I don't think so. But I'm, it's it's unfortunate that you have that impression in your mind because obviously that was something that you learn from whether it's media mm. or, or, or whatnot that, mm. oh, mm. Afghanistan must equal mental health disorders. So um, that's a, that's the thing I wanted to uh, segue into uh, with respect to, to healing um, and and how how do we get to the point where we can start looking at the you know post traumatic issues which you know it's 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 bad I mean we we're we're losing more veterans to suicide than the actual war itself. So clearly mm-hmm. there's an issue. There's something needs to change. The most mm-hmm. promising thing that I heard was when I was in uh, Las Vegas last year was the veterans that are there starting businesses. They were saying, no, man, this is this is our time to grow and heal. And we're going to do it through business. And I love that message because that's mm-hmm. what I embody here. But how how is the message going to change? Because it sounds promising. From what you're telling me, it sounds that, no, 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 we can fix this. It's just it mm-hmm. sounds like a messaging issue that mm-hmm. we can get past this and we can heal and we can be better. So what needs to change in your opinion in order for us to start not only convincing veterans, but also convincing everybody else that just because mm-hmm. you're a veteran and you have mental health issues doesn't mean that's it forever. And we're going to grow through it and we're going to be better because of it. Mm. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. Um, I think there's a bit of a problem in Canada in as much as I, I cannot remember the exact figures. So the, the, what I'm going to tell you is very rough, but I think in the United States, it's something like one in four people have a member of their kind of close family uh, has served in the military. Whereas in Canada, if, I think it's something like one in 25, even not even maybe one in 50. Yeah, I'd say it's close meaning to one in 50. Yeah. One in 50, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, which just means that the average person in America, you know, their brother or cousin or that someone in their family has served in the military or in the National Guard, part of, that's part of the military and the full-time military or the National Guard. <clears throat> um, whereas in Canada, uh, it's a lot rarer, meaning that the average, you know, 18-year-old, the average 30-year-old, 
um, maybe older folks like me, we know more people, but um, uh, that has has no immediate contact and, and doesn't understand what the person, what it means to serve in the military and the motivations, why, why somebody would do that, why somebody would enjoy it, uh, and why somebody would come back and feel that civilian society is is not living up to their expectations or um <clears throat> when i was uh <clears throat> excuse me uh when i was at school in the uk in the 1970s a, a, a substantial number of my teachers were in the had served in one of the branches of the military in the second world war or they'd been involved in some some way the some of the female teachers were in the nursing core or were working in factories right. and and it was my awareness of the military was 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 quite uh powerful by the age of like 13 14 15 and i, I joined the cadets actually when i was like a teenager because I, I was i was so impressed by what i heard and the sacrifices people had made um uh, and that's not the case now uh, at all the people in these positions of influence amongst the younger generation teachers and uh community leaders have have rarely served in the military mm -hmm. so, so it's a tough nut to crack how do we like sensitize the population to the reality of military life and how, how do we help veterans um what, one thing i would like to say is that an interesting um fact is that suicide rates amongst the serving military serving military are much much lower than the general population whereas suicide rates amongst veterans are higher interesting um and yeah, and, and basically, so what I say is, it's it's when you're in the military, you've got such a sense of purpose. You're you're learning new skills all the time. You've got that camaraderie with your with your buddies. Um, that 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 is a real hedge against suicide, and 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 makes you feel like your life is really important. And when people uh, are discharged or released from the military, uh, a, a lot of that sense of purpose overnight, without much preparation from the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, it disappears. And and uh, in a, in the US maybe there's more of an appreciation for veterans. There's certain jobs which are kind of preference. Veterans get uh, preferential treatment for, whereas in Canada that's less of the case. So I think what we need to do is have these kind of programs which allow veterans to 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 get the benefits of military life without being still being in the military. So it's like you said, camaraderie, physical exercise, doing things, helping others. Um, helping the community and uh some of the programs we've talked about already are, are doing are doing a good job um in that regard but there's certainly a lot of scope for innovation and for invention as well mm -hmm. to, to try and create new programs which can uh, like i said mimic those positive aspects of military life without obviously having to re-enlist in the military <laughs> right right which i don't think many of us would would take that torch back up so you think that the, the, the legion kind of used to do that well that's how it was kind of formed in a way in 1918 the british legion at least but lord haig said it should be mimicking and you know they have sergeant at arms and they have uh, yeah parades and they have their, their bar like the officers mess and stuff and, yeah yeah um, no and it's... that's that's one of those institutions right with time it's um it hasn't adapted to the to the times it had Absolutely. a golden opportunity had a golden opportunity with all of us coming back but they they missed that opportunity in my opinion because when i came back yeah. it just it wasn't the right fit oh. it was mostly civilian leadership that had no connection and here in canada we don't the last war we had was Afghanistan. Before that, it was really Korea, where we had a yeah. big group of veterans. And so, what's that? Fifty years of no veterans. Yeah. We had veterans, obviously, but to actually have a combat veterans is is a different is a different story because the the, the army, the military is on a different footing. It's a different level of intensity. So we had a big crop come back, and we're all young, right? We're all in our thirties, and yeah. it could have been a awesome time to just get a big boost in membership. But there's just so many bad stories of folks feeling like they they weren't welcome because yeah. they're just so entrenched in the way they were doing things, and it could have been a change in leadership, and could have been a change in just the culture itself. But there's other institutions out there, and I get it. You know, things change with the times, and so we're, we're it feels like we're trying to cobble things together right now. And I'm, and some of us are starting businesses, podcasts, 
nonprofits mm-hmm. and we're starting to get our legs under uh, under us and i like seeing that in the community here in canada at least and then the american community communities are already well established so making links with them because they've been doing it for a while it's basically they've been at war since <laughs> that <laughs> they had they had a bit of time off during like after vietnam and then it's yeah. been non-stop yeah. so they if anything they have a very well established yeah. veteran community that knows what they're talking about so um i want to know then obviously you wrote the book um yeah. how's how's your book uh, conveying this message and, and where can folks uh, get their hands on it and, and make sure that uh, veterans like ourselves can uh, can start reading all the good stuff that you're putting up there. Sure. Um, so the book is available on Amazon and it's also, it's published by a publisher called Springer. It's available on the Springer website. Um, and uh, alternatively, I mean, the book obviously has a price. I, I have a blog for psychology today where um, I write articles quite regularly about a lot okay. of the things I've talked about. And um, that's free of charge, obviously, and it has a lot of hyperlinks and videos uh, embedded to help people. Um, I've also got a YouTube channel, Recovery Mental Health, which um, uh, has a few videos regard- related to veterans. Actually, we just released a new one about medical cannabis use amongst veterans uh, and interviewed some uh, uh, some well-known veterans, um, in- including... Um, Brock, uh, Brock Blazek, who's uh, well known, the well-known veteran who uh, confronted Trudeau in Edmonton in the town hall. And, asking uh, <laughs> for too much. Asking for too yeah, much. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, uh, well, he's throwing money at every other group in society, left, right, and centre, yep. <laughs> causing hyperinflation. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, but the the main message of my book and my writing is really trying to. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to be realistic, but also trying to be positive and optimistic. I'm, I'm always looking for good programs, for uh, good ways that we can we can help men and help veterans, male or female, uh, and trying to support them and, and offer ideas that maybe uh, policymakers or community leaders can, can take up. Um, uh, and really, like an ethos of self help is behind a lot of what I do, whether it's as an individual or as a small group or a larger group of individuals that veterans. Um, uh, you know, when you're in the military, if you're in a problem, if you have a problem, you can't call the police or you can't call somebody else and say, can you come and solve this problem for us? It's it, you, The military has to solve the problem itself. And mm-hmm. um, and it's done, the Canadian military has done a very, very good job of uh, uh, of doing that. I was talking to a friend recently, and I, I think, um, uh, I don't think Canada has ever been on a losing side of, a, of any military conflict. Uh, if, if you think the UK was on the losing side of the uh, I would, American War of Independence. <laughs> I, would, I would, I would, I would argue we got our ass kicked in Afghanistan. I think I, that's, a, say that, that, yeah. that's a that's an L. Well, we didn't have a. No. I think we were weaseling our way out of it as a Western bloc because we didn't define the terms for success, which typically yeah. in a war is conquer, take the land, hold it, you know, defeat yeah. the enemy. There, yeah, Negotiate that was never part. Peace. That was never part of the the mission so therefore how did you lose well i mean yeah. everything has gone back to worse than when it was when we got there so if if that's any you know quantifiable measure of loss i think i think that's a loss right there so that's it. yeah but the failure of politicians rather than the military maybe without setting the terms of reference One, and- so 100 yeah. percent. i had this conversation with Stu Scheller, he's the uh, retired uh, lieutenant colonel, uh, marine marine lieutenant colonel who blew up the internet by criticizing the uh, the general oh, yeah. staff um, online while still serving. Yeah, and he was, and he's he's a pragmatist and he is uh, very principled. And he said, "Why are we why are we trying to win these wars without any defined definition of what winning is? If we're here to win mm. a war, let's win the war. And if it means." Yeah be attacking you know taliban in pakistan we need to do that that's part of the war <laughs> right. you know, why are we letting them attack us from there you know all these all these geopolitical things it's like yeah but we're at war yeah. and why didn't why were zero generals fired for losing and why was it there was always this turnover of generals and it was just handed off and check boxes and so yeah. and he, I, I think he's right and for us he said one of he's like the troops on the ground man we did everything that was asked of us and then some and had yeah. we had competent leadership and po- uh, political leaders, we would have 
won the war or any war. We're incredible war fighting force. And that's what kind yeah. of that's what kind of stings for a lot of us and stings for myself is that it kind of feels like it was for naught. And so that that plays into like moral injury, right? That we, yeah, exactly. we're kind of duped into doing this. And then at the yeah. end of the day, it resulted in a net negative for the that yeah. because it was sold to us like, hey, we're helping these people, but we didn't help them. Yeah. It made things worse. So there's that moral injury uh, yeah. component to uh, at least uh, myself and, and, and some of the Afghan vets that, that I know um, yeah. based on our service, you know. And completely different to the World War II veterans who whose homecoming and was they, celebrated. There was marches won. in every city. They won. They created a new world. Everyone yeah, was optimistic like, that the I can't imagine Even, what it was like for my grandfather, right? Because he came back from the Italian campaign and, you know, he lost a lot of friends and he was lucky to right. get back and I never got to know him. But the the sheer fact that you won, clearly you won. Yeah, yeah. The Nazis are gone. The Japanese, their empire, yeah. finished. It's yeah. let, Marshall Plan and let's get everything back to yeah. kick ass. And it must have been amazing to have that feeling that, okay, I survived yeah. this. Now let's make babies and let's, yeah, build, a, yeah. let's build an amazing yeah. society so that our kids don't have to experience this ever again. This was horrific. And it's just well, unfortunate that we yeah. didn't get to have that, that feeling of victory, right? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's all, I mean, I'm sure this is a bit off topic, but also a bit of a failure of NATO because, I mean, really it was the US, the UK and Canada who contributed and Australia, you know, the big numbers and the, the European, continental European countries didn't, it was a NATO uh, operation. No, um, Anglosphere really is the way, I, the way I heard it described. The Anglosphere would do the, yeah. the, the bulk of the heavy lifting. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And they're happy to have American divisions, you know, on their soil protecting them from the the east but you know are they contributing to what but anyway i think we, that's I think we just started a whole a podcast <laughs> yeah right. that's right yeah <laughs> i'm not my expertise so maybe i should keep my mouth shut before i get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> okay not enough people are listening so it's fine you'll be all right you'll be all right rob don't worry about it um so okay so uh what you're doing uh, just to uh to uh bring this uh bring this home um the the veteran population from what i understand uh has a lot of work to do but things are optimistic. There's all kinds of programs that are starting to pop up, which are having a real good impact. And from your point of view, it's really, let's, let's put some extra effort into these programs that have been uh, showing effectiveness and helping the, the, the veteran on the ground actually get better. And then slowly but surely with researchers like yourself and more awareness, we'll get to a point where more veterans will be healed and be able to thrive in, in their communities and, and throughout the rest of their life. If, if that's a, Good enough synopsis. Yeah, perfectly. If, if I need an agent, I should keep you on board, David, because you, your summaries of my work are better than I could do myself. I'll, I'll do your PR work. Sure, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you're a very good active listener as well, because, uh, but that's exactly it. Yeah, the, the bottom up grassroots programs, uh, which are springing up all over the country, have existed quietly for, for many years. They're the ones that I feel are really helping veterans. and uh, if people can get themselves inserted into those, and if if they aren't they aren't available, maybe can get together with some buddies and start something. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and with the internet, it can be advertised and the word can be spread. And uh, th these are really helpful for that kind of recovery, resilience, transitional journey. Amazing, amazing. We'll have to get a link of your uh, for your book up on my website as well, so folks can that would uh, be great can, can find that and um, start uh, consuming your content and your uh, YouTube channel that's huge you said you weren't on socials that's a lie that's the second largest <laughs> social media platform on the planet and you just casually mentioned that you have a youtube channel <laughs> well uh, it's, it's true but the, the good thing or maybe bad thing a good thing for me about youtube is that they um they stopped the instant messaging function or the mess or the email the, the communication function so um I, I avoid twitter or instagram or these kind of things i don't want to be deluged with uh Right. Uh, I right. was on Facebook for a short period of time. Got lots of strange uh, communications wild. coming my way. Shall we the say? Wild so world. Like, it's the wild world. Yes, I, get, exactly. I, get call, I get calls sometimes. I'm like, whoa, this is going way too far. All right, you're gone. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a wild word, but you got to take the good with the bad. You got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. Exactly. But um, Rob, um, I just want to say thanks for um, sharing your insights with uh, your research and. And you work with the veteran community. I know this is going to be a, a great bit of uh, knowledge for, for those that are listening. And uh, it's going to help the community get stronger and, and thrive into the, 
future. Do you have any last parting words before we uh, sum up? Um, no, thank you, David. And if there's any any small grassroots or, or larger bottom up groups out there that would like to ever partner with a researcher, I'd be happy to uh, receive any emails. People can email me robert at mcgill ca, and uh, some to, to get these uh, small bottom up grassroots programs funded and to get them accepted. Sometimes it's helpful to have research to show. Uh, mm -hmm. how they're affecting people, how they're influencing people's mental health, how they're being used, and that can be used in, as ballast in future applications to get funding. So uh, always willing to work with veterans and help if I can, yeah. 100%. And then when we figure some stuff out, we'll have to have a few pints in, uh, somewhere either in Verdun or close to the Douglas. And, oh, and most, figure most definitely, out. yeah. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. <laughs> my, old, my, old, my old favorite city. My old favorite city. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rob, thanks so much for, uh, for your time. Much appreciated. And, uh, folks don't forget train hard, fight easy. See you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can find out more about training, nutrition, and mindset at davemorrow.net. Be sure to like us on Facebook and Instagram at Dave Morrow PT. And don't forget strong people are hard to kill.